Can I start first with a, a question? Do we have a broad definition of what consciousness is? And I'm mindful that uh, many people listening are non-neuroscientists like yourself, and I include myself in that non-neuroscientist group. <clears throat> yeah, so I've, I've been on book tour for a while, um, hence part of this kind of being in a very different time zone across the world from you. And I swear to God, my next book is going to be about penguins. I'm just going to write a simple book about penguins because every, every lecture I give, every time, I stop to kind of give a reading. The questions are like, what is free will? Do we, you know, what is consciousness? Uh, what is the mind? Um, and I feel like I'm definitely, my next book is gonna be some like, just a nice little like vacation with a penguin, you know, like their swimming habits, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're how high they are, how tall they are, where they live, just something that's like actually, you know, you can look it up on Wikipedia and you have an actual answer. Um, I mean, so the way that I kind of think about it is, is first of all, this book is called 19 Ways of Looking at Consciousness in part because it's 19 different approaches. So each chapter is a different approach. Each chapter takes one moment. Um, I treat it like a translation of a poem, like a single poem you translate 19 different times. Um, you know, were I to be a little bit more convinced of a single version of this or a single definition, it would just be called like one way of looking at consciousness, right? I wouldn't have called it 19. Um, we had this, I had this interesting kind of conversation with my publisher about what to put on the jacket. And they, they kind of encouraged me to have a definition on there. Uh, the, the book jacket, right? The little thing you wrap around, you know, like a, like a winter coat around the book. And I, I just said like, I mean, they're kind of, if, if we can put it on the book jacket, there's no need for the rest of the book. And there's this funny way in which I really, truly, and I'm not trying to just get around the question. Now, this isn't me dodging. All these anecdotes and penguins and things are not me dodging. Like, I don't think we're even close. And so I don't even think we're close to a definition. And rather than what I've seen in many books going back hundreds of years, which have attempted to define it, I really wanted to actually step into the ambiguity and step into and embrace the fact that we don't have a good definition. If we did, there'd probably be more book sales, or like, you know, probably there would have been more fanfare if I had actually solved it in this book. And so the way that I kind of think about it is, I think about neuroscientists as effectively like 1000 AD Babylonian astronomers that are looking up in the sky and like what you know every single night they, they get out they get out of their house and they stare up at the sky and they're, they're there with the little notepads and they're notating exactly where the stars are moving and they made very good accurate charts of where the stars would be the next day the next year even hundreds of years later sea, seafarers sailors use those charts for hundreds of years because um, they were so accurate but if i wrote 19 ways of looking at how the stars move in the sky i'm a, i'm a babylonian astronomer and I'm, I'm on book tour or, or play tablet tour, whatever it is. And it's 19 ways of looking at uh, celestial mechanics, uh, you know, how the stars move in the sky. Every single one of those 19 ways would be wrong in some way. And there'd be little bits and pieces about the observations that would be correct. You know, the, the observations themselves are correct. That, that is data. And so I think similarly, neuroscience is in a position like that, which is to say, here's 19 ways of looking at consciousness, all of which are going to be wrong. Um, but there's a lot of really interesting stuff that overlaps, and, and there's still really interesting things that, can, that we can catalog and pay attention to. And then hopefully one day, someone will come along, some Galileo of the future will come along and kind of piece together a little bit of it, and then a Newton will come along, and then Einstein will come along. And, you know, it takes a while, but eventually we figure it out. So that's the hope. I'm really glad you mentioned Einstein, because I'm going to throw an Einstein quote at you. <laughs> what did Einstein mean when he said, no problem could be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it? Is he talking about the fact that consciousness is not fixed, but is evolving and is nebulous from moment to moment? Um, so... It's interesting. Um, I would I would guess that he was talking about the fact that from within we are limited to from within, and when I say within, I mean 
we are conscious creatures studying ourselves, right? We are, we are consciousness attempting to explain the, the process by which we became conscious. Um, and from the inside, like you're, you're gonna be limited by how you were built. Uh, th th this is, this, you're gonna be limited by the tools that you were given. And so, for example, we can infer a lot of other things that happen outside of our awareness and our sensory awareness, right? We, we know there's electromagnetic radiation out there. We know there's infrared light. We know that there's Wi-Fi signals that are allowing us to talk, right? These are real things that we can physically kind of deconstruct and they, see, they work 100% of the time. So like, okay, we can infer that they're, they're real and they're out there. Um, but from the inside to study consciousness, you know, I, I kind of firmly believe that one of consciousness's best tricks is um, presenting itself as elegant and effortless and, and seamless, right? You could, you could lose a whole chunk of your brain and a huge piece of your vision, your like visual field is gone and your consciousness doesn't care. It, it fills in whatever it can. I, I like to think about it like a gas, which kind of fills whichever volume it's given. Um, you know, we all have blind spots and it's just filled in our brain. People, people have gone years after having a stroke and having basically the left half of their visual field gone and they don't even notice because it's still 100% of who they are. Like the consciousness doesn't, there's no gaps, right? And so it's this, it's this almost like seamless like putty that gets filled in. And, and I, would, I would agree with Einstein that, um, you know, we are the, we are not the magicians in the magic trick of consciousness. We are the audience being fooled. And that, how do you get around that? Yeah, how do you, how do you find the trick? And I know you've alluded to one of the limitations of trying to define and understand consciousness is our language. Yeah. Um, so earlier I said I kind of treated these 19 ways, each like a translation problem. So like I find it still to be this like mystifying fact that um, so I have a 3D projector at home. I live in Los Angeles and I have a 3D projector because I just love 3D movies. To me, it's like a whole new genre of art that exists completely independently of film. You know, I will watch any movie in 3D, no matter what it is, because I consider it just to be a unique, rare, like diamond in the rough form of art. And I have hosted 3D movie parties. I, I have like 10 glasses that I give to all my, all my friends or guests. And every single time there's a group of people, there's one person in the group, and this is the actual population level statistic for this is 15%, one five. One five percent of people cannot see 3D. And, uh, you know, I, I put them on, the, I put the glasses on and they're like, oh, okay, it's great, but it, it just looks flat in 2D. It's no different than if they had seen it 2D. And so, so here's, here's the problem as I see it. Let's imagine that neuro, this was 100, 200 years ago. We didn't even have neuroscience as a field. And we did not know that 15% um, uh, of people can't see 3D. That person and I would be talking. Let's say we have coffee and we're talking about what kinds of things we like in the world. And I would say, well, I really love 3D movies as a genre. And they'd be like, well, they're okay. I can see why, you, you know, maybe, you know, there, there's not, they're okay. And there's two people. Let's imagine we're like maybe movie reviewers even. and I would, I would wax poetic and I would write like Shakespearean sonnets about 3D movies. And the other person would be like, well, you know, the plot was really thin because they're not, they're there for a different reason. We're having a completely different experience. And I use that as the example only because that's a tiny example. It's the tip of the iceberg of the differences that actually we have in between brains and subjectivity and everything. So for example, some people have no inner monologue. So some people have no voice or stream of uh, running voice or monologue inside their head. I would love um, that. I would love that. I would too. I, I like the strange thing though is that mine is incessant. So the inside of my head is very very visual, with an uh, with a constant stream of words, well, kind of alongside existing in parallel. But I can, for example, uh, replay any movie I've ever seen, mostly any movie I've ever seen. Um, but it goes at like 100x, it goes way too fast, it goes very quickly. But I can, I can go scene by scene through a movie. And so when I see a movie once, the joy that I get out of it, in part, is I can go home and replay it in my head. But there are people with aphantasia that cannot. But I think this comes at a cost, because I, my, other than words, 
I have no music on the inside of my head at all. Zero. I cannot, I, I, I haven't gone, I've never visited Ireland because I'm afraid of your pubs because of the singing. I, I am dead inside when it comes to music or musicality. I, there's nothing. I cannot play. I cannot sit here, close my eyes and play a song in my head at all. Zero. None that I've ever, the, the movies when I play them are silent in my head. And so, and there's other people, composers say, that sit there and they're composing in their head. I don't know how they do that. But to me, maybe that's, maybe that's the 3D movie thing again. Maybe I'm of the 15% of people that don't have musical depth or something like that. And so when we're, when we're trying to talk to each other, your question was about music, or sorry, uh, words. Um, when we're trying to talk to each other and we're saying things like, oh, did you like that symphony? Or, oh, did you like that movie? Or, oh, why did you become a musician? Or, oh, why did you become a writer? Or why did you become a film director? I think I became a writer because I just have a constant stream of words in my head. My guess is that some people become composers or musicians because they can replay all the songs that they've ever heard in their head. They can compose in their minds. Uh, Magnus Carlsen said he can play chess in his head, right? Like he doesn't even need a board. That's, a, that's cheating. That's an advantage. <laughs> and so we're using the same words like, like, you know, we're, we're using words like the inside of our minds or we're trying to communicate things, but words ultimately, I think, fail to actually capture the, the difference. A mouse, a parasite and a cat. It makes for a fascinating experiment. Can you tell us a little bit about this and uh, what observations can be extrapolated from the experiment in terms of uh, the uh, human neuroscience? Yeah, so my, my, my favorite definition of consciousness is actually that it's a parasite. And the reason is, um, I can explain that slightly, um, but first maybe like a little background on how I got to this, which is that my PhD work, uh, I, was, I did my PhD at Stanford under Robert Sapolsky, who's a kind of pop sci writer, so some people might know him. Um, and we, we studied this parasite that has to get from one cat to another cat. And it can only sexually reproduce inside a cat gut. So this is called Toxoplasma gondii. Um, anyone who's pregnant or been around pregnant woman or, um, uh, is told to stay away from cat litter. So like you're not supposed to clean your cat litter box. And the reason is because this parasite comes out in cat poop. Uh, it ends up in its natural life cycle is that it has to get from one cat to another cat. So it infects mice or rodents or rats or any kind of intermediate host. And my PhD was looking at whether or not once these intermediate hosts are infected, it goes to their brain. So where does it go in the brain? And then what's it doing in there to kind of muck around with, muck around with their preferences, perhaps. And so what I find so interesting about that is again, this question of the failures of language, which is to say, let's say that you could ask that mouse and you could ask that mouse, okay, you, you used to be afraid of cats. And then suddenly, I don't know, like a month ago, you stopped being afraid of cats. Like, what's that about? Like, do you, do you have any idea why? And they would give, you know, this like kind of like poetic reasons probably about why, you know, things are different now. And, oh, I really, I grew up and I, I started to, I'm sorry, this is the least scientific I've ever been in any interview, but like, the, you know, the mouse would give reasons that would be different than, than the, re the, the, the actual reason, which is that it has a parasite in its brain. And there, there, uh, there's a human equivalent of this, which is a lot of people have this parasite as well. A lot of people have toxoplasma gondii. And, there are some theories out there that it's behind the whole cat lady phenomenon, right? Of obsessively loving cats because the parasite gets to human brains as well. Um, it seems, and then you have some people that seem to be inordin inordinately attached to their cat. And so the same way that the mouse or the rat has maybe pushed towards the cat. So once they get infected, they seem to like the cat. They seem to prefer the smell of cats rather than be afraid of them. So something has switched in their behavior. So maybe this happens in humans is the theory. I don't think it is at all true. I think that's absurd. Humans are way more complicated. Uh, we're not afraid of cats to start with. Um, and, but, but the interesting thing would be to ask a person, say a cat lady or a cat man, I don't think it's gender specific, um, and, and, and ask them why they like their cat you know, no, no one, none of them are going to sit, they'll give a bunch of reasons about how they fit 
you know, the personality fits and it feels like a domestic business relationship and they just love and they can tell when they're sick and all these beautiful things, but they're not going to say they have a protozoan parasite nestled into their amygdala, uh, changing their free will, right? Like nobody gives the real reasons. And so language did not evolve to be good at actually giving causality or the, the, you know, the real reason. It, it evolved to be good enough to get by like around some campfires. So like I, I fundamentally believe that a large part of the misunderstanding that we confront when two people talk about consciousness or their own minds or their own disagreements or their own preferences, it's ultimately, I think, a translation problem. Well, at least I, I, I know most show notes now for this particular episode will include the term cat ladies and parasites and neuroscience. <laughs> That's fascinating because I have a few friends who have uh, acquired cats in recent times and uh, they are, are women. And uh, I enjoy telling them this particular anecdote. But you, as far as you're concerned, it's not at all legitimate as far as an, an observation is concerned. It's just... It's just been postulated by somebody out there and it's 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 got it's gotten legs in recent times is that it yeah i mean there's no scientific evidence whatsoever that it's changing human behavior um sorry with with respect to cats um uh there there you know there are a lot of compelling kind of one-off studies that have looked in humans so so enough humans have had this parasite i wrote a tongue-in-cheek what i thought was a, a jonathan swiftian satire uh or two articles for slate about how maybe having the parasite, uh, countrywide rates of the parasite make uh, uh, seem to correlate with victories in the World Cup, and how uh, uh, maybe they said so Chanel used to use cat uh, uh, this pheromone musk from a Abyssinian civet cat, which comes from the ass the cat's butthole, um, or the the kind of gland that secretes this stuff so that they can mark their territory. And so again, I did a Jonathan Swiftian satire of. Well, maybe Chanel number no. five is so seductive as a perfume because they're using this cat pheromone and France has one of the highest rates. They have, I think 40, I think it's 40% of France has the toxoplasma parasite, uh, like literally 40% of the human population. And so I was like, well, maybe, you know, wouldn't that be cute? But again, as a scientist, you don't, you know, Science, the headlines and the, the, the way that science gets out into the rest of the world is tricky because um, there are a lot of single studies that, should, that have a conclusion, like one-off studies, like just one study gets published somewhere that says a thing. And as a, when in the, on the inside, as a scientist, you, you think to yourself, oh, interesting, that is maybe, that maybe means it's a question worthy of study, not even further study, study to begin with. We, we don't really believe anything until it's been proven, not proven, but kind of replicated maybe 20 times. Whereas BBC, when they put their headline out, it's you know a single headline based on a single study. And it's as if that's what we say or believe. There was a uh, Pravda, the Russian. So when I, when I published my work on this mind control parasite, um, there was a Pravda.ru, so a Russian newspaper headline, big headline, there was scientists show cats enslave humanity. So, you know, it can be tough to interpret the, the results. Well, this is the media. They're always guilty of misinterpreting things and misrepresenting things. Certainly, I'm, I'm very aware of that. Um, and given my own background in media. Um, can I ask you a question? And this question has always intrigued me. Why... Is it that human beings are the only living organisms that have a consciousness as far as we're aware? I mean, we evolved through adaptation and natural selection, but so did dolphins, jellyfish and alligators. Why is it that we are the only living organisms that have consciousness and they don't? And how does it benefit us? Do you, so you really think like, do you have any pets? Do you have a dog or a cat? Or... I don't. That's the thing. I don't. Don't. I think if you did, you would be 100% certain that they are also conscious. I'm surprised you, you would actually say that it's just humans. I, I find that's actually, it, as far as I have come across, that's a, that's a minority viewpoint that it's only humans. Well, I, I, I say that in the context of when I say consciousness, I'm talking about being aware of their existence, but also aware right. of their mortality. Okay. Right. So, okay. Yeah. So maybe instead of, 
entirely dodging the question and answering about penguins, I should have maybe even just remotely narrowed in on what I think consciousness is because yeah, no, here we are 20 minutes later and we realize we've been talking about a different thing the whole time, apropos my, my point. Um, uh, yeah, so it sounds like what you're saying is consciousness is a kind of like meta awareness or an awareness about being alive or uh, a being whose being is at stake or, or, or is, is, and I would, I would say that that's a, I, I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even put that in the category of consciousness studies. I would call that kind of a cognition, um, kind of metacognition, which is to say humans have, we're conscious, but then we also have these, this unique capacity for a kind of language that allows us to make abstractions and generalizations and to actually have awareness and knowledge of our death and things like that. We are conscious of, right? And I, I, think, I think that word itself, to be conscious of, which means to be aware of, has, is a totally separate word than consciousness. It just happens, it's like a pun, it's a bad pun. It, you know, to be conscious of, I wish it didn't exist. I wish we had a different word. I wish we just stuck to, to be aware of. It means, I think, the same thing. Um, and I just wish we stuck to it because it does lead to this kind of ambiguity with consciousness itself. So like, I would claim that in terms of just like the, what it is like to have a, something that is like to be you, you know, like I open my eyes and it feels like there's something that it is like to be me. I think organisms all the way down to like crickets have that. I don't know where it stops, but like, you know, mammals have a special thing going. We're, we're pretty good at thinking, but thinking and cognition and awareness are like kind of like bonus add-ons, I would say. Consciousness itself feels pretty fundamental. Um, and I don't, I don't know where in the tree of life it kind of stops, right? I don't think single cells are conscious, but I do think insects are. I, I don't know. And if you ask, honestly, if you ask all consciousness scholars, we all draw our lines at separate places and we have these kind of post hoc rationalizations, but nobody, nobody knows. You mentioned earlier on about our understanding of consciousness being at the level of stargazers, uh, going back to the Babylonian times, uh, as far as our, uh, as I said, our understanding is concerned. Um, alternative, uh, not alternative, artificial intelligence, AI. Do you welcome that when it comes to trying to develop a great understanding of what consciousness is, or is that a distraction? No, I think I think it's I think it's great work, um, and I think it will be immensely useful when someone does figure out a little bit more about consciousness. Maybe even does have a unified theory, but they will not be they will not it will not be because they have converged. And and here's what I mean by that. Um, so, Dar when Darwin set out on the Beagle, right? He set out and he went down to South America for five years on this little journey. Like people knew that there were different species, that there were different kinds of bird, right? People knew all the basic facts that he had observed, that he was about to observe. <clears throat> but something else was happening at the same time. There was a parallel science and that parallel science was geology. Geology for the first time was accepting the fact that the earth was actually maybe billions of years old and not a couple thousand. And there were also this brand new science came on which was plate tectonics. Nobody, no, nobody knew at the time, like, like now we take it for granted that there's like plates and that's what causes volcanoes and earthquakes and, and that all of our continents used to be together, right? There used to be one supercontinent. And so Darwin goes off and he sets off on his little boat ride and he, he makes his observations, but his observations would have been useless were it not also for the geologist saying, hey guys, guess what? We think Africa and South America used to be collided and they split. And now there's 3000 miles of ocean between them, but, but we think it, there didn't used to be. And now for the first time, you could conceive of the fact that, oh my God, those species that are on the West coast of Africa and the East coast of South America, they're the same, they're, they came from the same spot. They came from the same, but you know, it took like, five months to get, or three months to get across the ocean. There was no fathomable way that you could have imagined at the time 
that the, the animals had like swum or swam, I don't know the right word, across that distance, right? Or even flown. And it, so, so, you know, Darwin did a great work in his lifetime, but he also had to have this parallel thread of thinking and a different science to bolster some of the observations or reframe some of the observations. And so that's what I think is gonna happen with AI and consciousness, which is to say, AI in this analogy is the geologists. They are coming up with something, they're doing their plate tectonics work. And then there's a bunch of people over in consciousness world. They're just studying natural consciousness. And at some point, the AI researchers are gonna come up with a learning rule or something, something about what it means to be, have a sense of self or a sense of body or what it means. I don't know. I don't know what they're gonna come up with, but they're gonna come up with something that allows us over neuroscience to finally understand all these observations that we've been having. That's my, that's my theory. So, so it's a lot of people think they're gonna converge or <clears throat> like they're making conscious robots or something. They're, they're obviously not making conscious robots, but they're the, they're the geologists. They're gonna come up with something that we're gonna use. That's my, that's my hope at least. One of the upsides of the pandemic uh, one of the very few upsides of the pandemic is it has seen a huge acceleration in uh, the general knowledge and understanding uh, by the scientific community when it comes to immunology, et cetera, and the epidemiology. Um, there hasn't been the same degree of progress in neuroscience. So my, my question, I suppose, is, is it frustrating being a neuroscientist because of that lack of momentum and progress? Yeah, it totally is. I mean, in part, not only did neuroscience kind of not accelerate at the same pace as other sciences during the pandemic, it actually decelerated significantly because we couldn't do human subjects research anymore. I know I had many friends who are professors who had their labs shut down. They couldn't, they could, couldn't do work because you couldn't get a person in a scanner in a room for hours. So like, you know, we, it's, it was, um, you know, there's this, oh God, in the, in the whaling museum in Nantucket, there's this small uh, room that is dedicated to the, the four years during World War II, where effectively like people were so busy killing each other that they stopped whaling. And so the whale, from the whale's point of view, it's like the four years of great peace, right? Um, so I think about this, like there's this inversion, which is like virology and, and, and immunology that those sciences took off. And, but in neuroscience, we had like a really bad couple of years. We had, you know, we had the opposite. We had our, we, everything shut down. Um, I don't know what it would take. There's like, there's a few sci-fi books about, you know, like if an insomnia epidemic were to take over or, you know, like, like we would have to, what would the equivalent of a global epidemic be, a pandemic that got people interested in the brain? I mean, in some sense, we already have it. It's Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, but we kind of ignore that. Uh, I, mostly we ignore that. Um, I don't know. And there's probably a sleeping, there's probably actually a sleeping pandemic or like quality of sleep pandemic around the world, right? People are getting terrible sleep. There's all kinds of things. Uh, suicides are on the rise in the US. I mean, you know, the, the, the signs are there, but we've just, we just haven't, as a field, as neuroscientists, we haven't, we haven't provided many answers. We've just asked a bunch of questions. So I think people are kind of fed up. The, the research and development in, I think at some point, I don't know if this has changed since 2019, for 2018, but in 2018, I think all of the top five major pharmaceutical companies in the world all shuttered, closed their neuroscience research and development. Outside of one, maybe two Alzheimer's, everyone went to the, the money-making drugs, the, the cancers and the insulin and the uh, things like that. Um, so like, you know, in, in some sense, we need, to, we, need to, we need to show that we can do anything. Uh, we haven't cured a single disease. Um, you know, people have, there's some miracle stories from, from the kind of psychiatric world, but there are some horror stories as well. We, you know, there's a long legacy of horror stories in terms of what drugs can and cannot do to the, to the human mind. And um, it's tough to get out of that. We're, so I, I don't know. Yeah, it is frustrating. It is honestly frustrating. Physicists are like landing on, like they're planning on landing on asteroids and studying the Big Bang. And they have, they're studying like the Higgs boson under a multi-billion dollar like particle collider with hundreds of thousands of PhDs 
all knowing what to do. But you, you know, in neuroscience, we, we don't even can't even tell you what being sad is. From a, a pharmaceutical perspective, is part of the reason why, let's say, man-made drugs or even drugs derived from nature, such as psilocybin and mushrooms, is part of the reason why those haven't been effective because of the complexity of the brain and the complexities surrounding consciousness? Um, I think it's just the, more broadly, the complexity of biology, um, which is to say, like, go look in a, any drugstore on the planet and just look at the side effects um, of any drug, even the simplest drug. That's data, right? Like, that's, that's data on how complex the biology is. Noth like, nothing is 100% of biology. You put the same thing into the same system and a different thing comes out. Um, <clears throat> So a, hard, a large part of it is just like biology is really, really messy. And what works for you does not work for me. And, and what works for me today might not work for me in a week. Uh, you know, the story, the story of the historical stories of the attempts to create pharmaceutical drugs or uh, either synthetic or that we take from nature is just like, it depends on the person and the range and the dose and what they had for a meal a while ago. And, and we don't, you know, they're, they're like basal levels of serum salt floating in their blood and um, what, what, how much their receptor binding affinity for a certain neurotransmitter, like all of these things matter deeply and greatly. And it's really, really difficult to come up with something people I think want, and they maybe expect because physics has given them universal theories, theories that work everywhere. F equals MA equals MC squared. We can shoot a rocket, tiny little autonomous vehicle to Mars and have it drive around and it lands within like a millimeter precision. Um, and, and, you know, in neuroscience, we don't really know how Advil works. You know, like we know it relieves headaches and we think we know, but it kind of does sometimes it doesn't and then it can cause all kinds of, you know, there's no, there's no panacea. And it, you know, I see beauty in that. I, it's, I, when I say it's frustrating, I mean kind of the perception of the field is frustrating, but fundamentally that means it's the most, it's the hardest puzzle to solve that we have, right? It's, but, it's but everything. It's, it's certainly got the greatest scope for growth, absolutely. And I think to have the biggest impact on humanity, because I think if we can figure out how consciousness works, I think then the sky is the limit, really. Well, it'd be, one would hope that, it would, one would hope that like, if we did figure it out, we would recognize, oh wait, this is actually harder to build than we had ever imagined. It's actually unique, more unique than we thought. And so maybe we should like value other people's instead of not as much as we do. You know, like I, I get terrified with both versions of whether or not there's other life out there and whether or not there isn't like outside of earth you know, aliens out there. Both answers are terrifying. Yes and no are terrifying, right? Um, but the no is even more terrifying to me because that means this is it. This is us. This is everything, right? On this little planet. And that means that we are the only thinking cognitively meta-aware creatures in the entire goddamn universe. And with that knowledge, we still are awful to each other all the time. You know, like it's just so ridiculous. And so I, I do hope that maybe there's a, um, I don't know. I don't know how to, yeah, I mean, I don't know. What would the equals MC squared for consciousness look like? Like how would people respond to it, right? Because Einstein did his equals MC squared and then we got the atom bomb. So like, what would, what would the, <laughs> you know, let's say we solve consciousness. How is someone going to use it afterwards? I don't know. It's it, absolutely it's a, it's a complex subject, and I think we could talk about it for hours and hours, and uh, just like bubblegum, come up with nothing in the end. Um, but uh, certainly, um, <laughs> I, I I can recommend your book, uh, uh, Doctor Patrick House, and uh, let me give the name of the book again: Nineteen Ways of Looking at Consciousness. I think, which I, I think certainly it gives a sense of just how complex uh, and the subject and the understanding are are. are our very nascent understanding of consciousness is in this day and age. But I, I'd like to thank you for joining me today from Tel Aviv on the podcast and for giving me so generously some of your time. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation.